Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for the webinar, uh, Revitalizing Communities Through Food. Uh, I'm Jen Hawes, the Partnership Manager for Island Press, and I'm happy to welcome you today. Um, the webinar today will follow this, this format. We're gonna do some introductory and framing presentation by Mark Winnie, who's the author of Food Town USA. Following that, Brooke Harris will talk briefly about her role as the Detroit Action Strategist at IOBI. And then I'll hand it over to Sarah Reed, who's the owner and operator of Flavorable Creations in Detroit. After the presentation, we're gonna open it up to questions and Mark will moderate our conversation. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. To do so, please use the questions box in the GoToWebinar panel which should be on the right side of your screen. If you have any problems, you can also use the chat box to contact the organizers. Following the webinar, you will receive a link to a brief survey. Your feedback is imperative to helping us continue to provide these free webinars. We ask that you please fill out the survey to help us out. This webinar is being recorded. Expect to see a copy of the recording by tomorrow. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Island Press. Island Press is an environmental nonprofit book publisher. We were founded in 1984. Our mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment. We elevate voices of change, shine a spotlight on crucial issues, and focus attention on sustainable solutions, just like we're doing here today. Um, oops. Our partner, IOBI, helps uh, neighbors grow and implement great ideas one block at a time. The crowdsourcing platform at iob.com, I'm sorry, .org, connects leaders with funding, resources, and support to make neighborhoods safer, greener, and more livable, and more fun. If you'd like to submit your project, we encourage you to do so at iob.org slash idea. I'll go back to that slide. So we are offering Mark's book today at a discount of 30% for all attendees of the webinar. Uh, we encourage you to purchase it at islandpress.org um, and you can use the code webinar for 30% off. Now I'd like to introduce you to our panel. First, Mark Winnie. Um, Mark, uh, from 1979 to 2003, Mark was the executive director of the Hartford Food Systems, a Connecticut nonprofit food organization. He's the co-founder of Community Food Security Coalition, the Connecticut Food Policy Council, and the Santa Fe Food Policy Council. Mark's writings have appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, Sierra, Orion, and Yes, to name just a few. He's the author of four books, including Closing the Food Gap, and his most recent one, Food Town USA. Mark speaks and writes on topics related to community food systems, food policy, and food security, and serves as a senior advisor to the Center for a Livable Future at Johns Hopkins. Brooke Harris is IOB's Detroit Action Strategist. Born and raised in Detroit, Brooke has spent most of her career as an educator, from after school programs to teaching middle school and high school English. She received her bachelor's in English and her secondary teaching certificate at the University of Michigan. She holds a master's in social justice. Brooke's first experience, Brooke first experienced community organizing while working with grassroots education activists. With her sister, she co-founded Hollaback Detroit, a local branch of the international organization dedicated to ending street har harassment. She launched the site via an IOB project. Brooke is also a board member and volunteer of Girls Rock Detroit. Sarah Reed is the co-founder of Flavorful Creations LLC, a bakery in Detroit, Michigan. She owns and operates the business with her husband, Ruben. Instead of a brick and mortar location, Flavorful Creations utilizes a commercial kitchen space at the historic Eastern Market in Detroit. Sarah loves to bake, create, and help people. While working at a homeless shelter in Detroit, she would bring in her creations to share with coworkers, in addition to, to lighten the sometimes somber mood. Her coworkers enjoyed the treat so much that they asked to purchase more. With Ruben's encouragement, they launched Flavorful Creations in 2011. 
Now they wholesale to various markets and coffee shops throughout Detroit. So now I'm going to hand over this to Mark. Mark, let me give you the presenter. And Mark, you're on mute. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Jen, for the introduction and for the opportunity to bring us all together in these uh, strange and difficult and really challenging times. And I look forward to you know sharing a few thoughts with all of you, and I really look forward to hearing from my uh, co-panelists today. I think they have some great ideas and experience to offer all of us. And you know, I, I would, of course, be remiss if I didn't say something about what's going on to all of us and uh, this um, uh, COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in, we find our communities in, you know, we find our traditional ways of life and going about, you know, the to and fro of our work and families and community, you know, wildly disrupted. And, um, and I, I guess I also, having been through various uh, disruptions in my own life and um, over different periods from 9-11 to uh, blizzards that shut communities down for two weeks to oil shortages, which stopped food trucks from running uh, back as far as the 1970s, that um, I tend to feel that we need to look at what might be a silver lining and the silver lining if there was is one and i do think there is is an opportunity to learn an opportunity to find a new way of you know conducting business in this country and i think the kind of work that people who constitute today's audience do is very much a good example of how to create the diversity and the excitement and a more localized approach to our economy and um, I actually had the opportunity to recently write a blog. If anyone is interested, you can go to markwinnie.com, where I looked at what you know the impact of the coronavirus is on our communities right now, and particularly our food systems and farmers markets and uh, our schools and and people, young people who depend on school food for a big part of their meal. Um, I also uh, looked at the importance that food banks are playing right now. Keep in mind that food banks are being hit hard by the lack of food, which is, uh, as our food system is being disrupted, more and more food needs to be, you know, that they normally would source uh, as a donation or a surplus from larger suppliers has not been as available. And they've been having to actually buy food on the market which uh, puts a strain on their budget. So if we can help them out financially, and then also the number of volunteers they've had has diminished dramatically over the last week or two. And you know they've also instituted some very safe procedures that volunteers can follow. So if people do wanna go and help out a food bank, this would be a really important time to do so. I also want to suggest that as you look at what's going on in your communities, that you take this opportunity to document what some of the failures and problems and disruptions are. Keep those in mind. And then when they when we we come up for air again, when we have an opportunity to reassess, you know, we can hopefully get back to normal. Let's learn from these lessons. Let's make sure we have that documentation in place that demonstrates clearly that we have to be prepared and that being prepared will often mean a much more localized community controlled food system, one that is coordinated uh, among different stakeholders and where there is collaboration with many different parts of the food system. So let's, let's do what we can now. Let's keep in mind that we are focusing on local community-based solutions to our food system, and let's learn from this present crisis. So just wanted to offer that those opening remarks as a framing for the discussion today. Now, I you know, to this end, uh, though I had, did not have anything like this pandemic in mind when I wrote my book, uh, Food Town USA, um, I did believe through the work that I've done over the course of 40 years now, 
that communities do hold a lot of the answers. They have the solutions at hand and they have developed individually in a way that brings people together um, to create viable, very robust, uh, very diverse food systems. So I'm gonna, this, this was what my story was and I wanna get into that right now, which means I'm gonna go uh, present my slides if I can remember how to do that. I need to minimize my screen. Just bear with me for one second. Hopefully this is, this is not working, Jan. Uh, Jan, excuse me, uh, let me know. But um, I set out on this journey to visit seven cities. Uh, they're perhaps, they may not necessarily be unique, but they are not uh, typically our big food cities that we think about, you know, exciting, cool, hip food centers. And uh, um, okay. So I'll Jen, run your slides, Mark. You're gonna run them. Yeah. All right. So we can go. Give me we can go second. to the first slide. Okay. Uh, I'm not seeing the first slide. Okay. Now I am. So I want to dem. I wanted to demonstrate that in places that are perhaps considered a little more ordinary when we think about food and perhaps ordinary by at least relatively speaking means they're not you know brooklyn or boulder or berkeley but perhaps there are other b cities like uh, bethlehem or boise but i wanted to demonstrate that good food in effect is the new normal it's exciting to see how um dynamic and robust the local food scene has become almost everywhere. Um, I wanted to look at what that what the diversity of our food scene looked like um, from restaurants to food banks to farmers markets. Uh, I wanted to I wanted to understand what was contributing to the success of these places. You know what why why is something working and what lessons can we learn from these places? Uh, where the, this work is taking place. Um, and I also, you know, it's the food system is interesting in the sense that it can be fun and exciting and a huge palette of wonderful food options opens up to us. But at the same time, we recognize that good food is not necessarily the, the, no, the normal, the prevailing condition for all of us in a community. So we have to make sure that we are looking at the justice issues, looking at the gaps that exist within uh, communities around the country. And I sort of labeled this or dubbed it, you know, dubbed it the, the idea that we're taking care of our own. And that is what I found in the places where I went. And of course, the, what, the, what are the challenges? What are, what are the unique challenges? They run from uh, the environmental climate change challenges to poverty, to hunger. <clears throat> to um, just the, the, the attempt to achieve some degree of sustainability. So this is what I set out to do and to kind of to extrapolate uh, lessons learned from these places, which again, are not extraordinary. Uh, they're perhaps more ordinary, but I think the, the lessons learned were essentially universal. So let me go on to the next slide. And we're gonna start just by taking a look at some of the cities that I went to. We're on Bethlehem. Yeah, I know. I'm trying. To, there's a big. There's a pop up right in the middle of my screen that I can't figure out how to get rid of. But um, I'll just proceed otherwise. So, first city that I I worked with and spent some time in is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I know you're from all over the country, and perhaps you're from some other from some uh, nations, other nations other than the United States as well. Um, so, you know, these places may be familiar to you, maybe they're not. Uh, but in Bethlehem, it was one of these cities that got 
hammered by the loss, by the decline of industrial America. Bethlehem Steel was a very dominant force, employed up to 40,000 people at its height. Uh, it's really an iconic industry in effect um, in a, and an iconic corporation in the history of uh, the 20th, 20th century industrial America. It went out of business. It folded, it collapsed like many other such businesses around the country. 30,000 people were thrown out of work in the 1990s. What does a city like that do next? Well, what I began to see was that food became a really important part of the city's revitalization. It had to come up with a new identity. It was no longer a steel town. It was now something else. Arts and culture were also a big part of what was going on in, in Bethlehem. And I think to the credit of those who were sort of driving the city's revitalization, they saw the power of both art and food in a synergistic fashion to revitalize the city. At the same time, they had this wonderful resource called the Lehigh Valley, where a tremendous amount of food was being produced. Farmers and so forth were um, you know, out there. And the food movement was beginning to pick up steam. Uh, and they also had institutions uh, such as um, uh, Lehigh University and uh, hospitals. And they began to you know, recognize as well that they had a role to play in the uh, revitalization of Bethlehem. So just to give one example of what began to happen is that small, uh, small restaurants, uh, usually owned by uh, people in the community, um, representing a wide swath of cultural and ethnic diversity, um, of which Bethlehem had plenty. Had, it was a very diverse city in many respects. These uh, restaurants started to open up in the, in the areas of town where uh, that were most challenged socio, socially and economically. And um, they also, this, this opening of food businesses was supported in part by the city of Bethlehem and, and economic development organizations and recognizing very clearly that food was an important part of what they could do to rebuild the city. And at the same time, uh, Lehigh University said, well, you know, we have all these students with a lot of pent up demand for, you know, reasonably priced food. Let's, let's encourage them to live and shop in and around Bethlehem. And in, a, in another, another direction, a uh, performing arts charter school uh, dedicated to the arts, opened its a major facility for the Lehigh Valley right in downtown Bethlehem in close proximity to this area where they were trying to conduct economic development. And 650 high school age uh, students began to come, oh, this is just four years ago now, began to come to uh, Bethlehem you know, Monday through Friday. And they would hold over 90 performances every uh, during the school year. Um, it, in the evening where parents and friends and family would come in and watch their children perform. And this became a tremendous source of, of purchasing power, of people buying food, shopping in, in that area and going to uh, restaurants, going to brew pubs, going even to distilleries. Very exciting, robust food scene, scene evolved and one that was reasonably affordable also, actually quite affordable in many cases. So it was a synergy of bringing together different aspects of the community. Let me go on to the next slide, because I know I'm not going to be able to have enough time to, to go to all these. Um, <laughs> let me, let me look, as an example, another example of the role that food can play in economic development of, a, of an area that's already uh, challenged socially and economically. Alexandria, Louisiana, which is in central Louisiana, made up of 12, par it's a 12 parish region. Um, it's a high, it's a very high poverty rate, very high obesity rates and diet, di and obesity diet related illnesses. An organization called Central Louisiana Economic Development Alliance uh, be was a very, a major driver in trying to bring back the area, bring back the economy of that region, which really had nothing 
significant in the way of businesses to uh, anchor their their economy. Uh, they actually hired three people full time to work just on food system issues. And as a result, you began to see a growth in, in farmers markets. You began to see a growth in coffee shops, brew pubs, farm to table restaurants. Small food businesses were also established. And they uh, were, were really very, very just recognized. I think that the key lesson here was that they began to recognize that food was a very important part of economic development. And that became a very much of a driver for the work that CLEDA or the Central, Law, Central Louisiana Economic Development Alliance was working on. Um, and let me go on to the next slide. Just look, just want to extract a few quick lessons from places uh, from around the country. Boise, Idaho, I particularly wanted to focus on Boise because I thought it was a, a, a challenging place given that Idaho is one of the your reddest political, most conservative states in the country. <laughs> and Boise happened to be a very progressive oasis, you might say, in the middle of the state. And it had a tremendous amount of uh, food activity going on. And really became, food became really a very defining element of that community. And I think I wanted to highlight here the role that government played, city government in this case, not state government, but city government, uh, recognizing that through planning and through a focus again on food as an important driver in the local economy, they could really make begin to make a difference. A, a, an explosion of new restaurants, a, a tremendous connection between um, uh, farmers in, throughout the area and uh, those restaurants uh, took place at the same time that the city was saying we want small scale development, business development, including food to take place all throughout the city, not just in a central business district, but to, to sort of inspire and, and improve the quality of life in communities and neighborhoods throughout the city. So they, they set up plans to make that happen sort of deconcentrate the, the kind of development that was taking place in the city, as well as focus on other, uh, other areas, other interesting opportunities, such as an old farm that they decided to protect and use as an educational center. And again, like other cities, they were decided they had to take care of their own as well. And there's a robust food, food bank programs. There's robust efforts to engage people with food assistance programs like SNAP. And the farmer's market, which is a very vital part of the community, uh, has a mobile market which serves senior housing. Let's go on to the next slide. Jen, you can go to the next slide. We're on Sitka. Um, Sitka, I think I'll, I, I might, I might end with Sitka, but I think the, um, what I really, the Sitka, Alaska, town of 9,000, definitely the smallest one that I looked at, and uh, generally the most rural also is on the, you know, the, the kind of the southeastern panhandle of Alaska. It's what I was particularly fascinated about here, and where I thought there were valuable lessons to be learned was that Sitka is 800 miles by boat from Seattle. There are no roads into Sitka. You only get there by water or air. Uh, it also happens because of these factors, happens to have the highest priced food in the country. And uh, what people were doing to address that situation, to address their vulnerability, and to also address the environmental changes that were taking place, including vast changes in the marine species that uh, were constituted really the most significant part of their economy through commercial fishing, they were coming together as a community like no place I have ever seen. Um, I think I want to just highlight one particular aspect of that. Uh, in a place where it's almost impossible to grow food because of the land and, and to some degree as well as the climate, um, they set up something called planning day where the community comes together on one Saturday uh, every year, and they bring their projects and their ideas for things that are gonna improve that community, usually, had, usually with a, having an economic 
nature, but also something that was going to have a, a social impact as well. And they kind of threw a process of sort of negotiation and 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 inter interaction between all the all the people there. They select two or three projects that they are going to focus on as a community. And that focus comes in the form of some funding as well as in-kind support from the people in that in Sitka. Uh, over the last 10 years from these planning day events, about 20 projects have been spawned. Out of that, about 60% um, about are food and farm related. But I, I think I, I was just enamored with the fact that in a place that small and with a tremendous amount of challenges, they were able to come together as a community and yet they use this process as a way to really prioritize projects and work that they need to do that's gonna, that's gonna better the life of everybody there. So let me go to the very last slide here in this uh, collection, Jen, just to sum it up. I also looked at Youngstown, but we're gonna, you know, Ohio, but I wanna go on to the next, Jacksonville, Florida was another place to, with a lot of exciting activity, a lot of challenges in terms of race that they were overcoming. But let's again, let's go to the next, uh, last slide. Portland, Maine. Lessons learned. There we are. So where did this all come out? I think that, you know, what is, striking and I think something that presents a good opportunity for us to really develop a stronger movement, not only one that's community-based but national in scope, is that food insecurity and limited access to good food, diet-related health challenges, and of course climate change, the changes in local economy and challenges of equity uh, are, are in income inequality, are universal in the sense that they are hitting all of our communities. Yeah, so this is something to begin to unite around. A lot of what I found in these communities, uh, in fact, I'd say almost everything I found in these seven communities wasn't there 10 years ago. I mean, I think that I found that rather remarkable that you know everything that I was seeing, all this amazing activity was very new over the last 10 years. The other thing that I think is interesting and not, not just interesting, but necessary is food system awareness. In other words, we understand that food is part of a system, uh, that there are many dots that are connected and that we would, when we go about our work, which is usually focused on one need or one project at a time, we need to keep in, keep in mind all the sort of the vast scope of the food system and what all the elements are because it will help us do our work much, much more effectively. Certainly food was making a significant contribution to not just the economy, but the quality of life. I mean, this was a sort of an, in, in a way it was sort of an interesting challenge where, you know, the quality of life might, which you might say with respect to food is, wow, I get great new brew pubs. I get 10 IPAs to choose from. I have, uh, I can get a great cappuccino here. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's affecting everybody equally, um, but it certainly draws a bigger swath of a community together, and it also improves the quality of life. But at the same time, people were recognizing that that's not enough, that everybody has to be, benefit from this as well. Another sort of a universal trait is that local governments are becoming much more engaged in the sort of the sort of the food life of a community and recognizing its value. One way you begin to see this manifest is through the development of food policy councils. There are something like 300 or so food policy councils around the country now. I only have to go back to the early 90s to only find a handful. So their growth is, I think, significant and indicative of the fact that you know, we are taking a bigger picture look at our food system and that policy and government are a big, are playing a big role. One thing that I, maybe was a little bit of a surprise for me is the importance of individuals. Um, you know, I've always been a, a community organizer. I've always been, you know, very much invested in, you know, developing the capacity of organizations and the role that organizations play in catalyzing change. 
But I also learned how much individuals uh, play a really important role in the work that's going on uh, as entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, as well as sort of for-profit business entrepreneurs. Millennials, young people, younger people anyway, uh, are were very prominent um, in starting businesses. They are lead, playing leadership roles, returning often to communities where they grew up. Uh, had had left uh, for a while, came back and said, what can I do to make this place better than it is? So I, I think just the fact that we need to pay attention to how millennials can contribute and the fact that they are is important. Entrepreneurism, I think, is being redefined in daily. You know, it's no longer the hard driving up by the bootstraps type of individual that is mythologized in American literature. It's really kind of a community supported form of entrepreneurism. The individual with seeking support from the community, uh, mutual aid, mutual support among entrepreneurs, that's really the kind of model that we're seeing today, seen across the nation when it comes to food. And equitable food systems were being actively pursued, making sure that everybody is taken care of, making sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate, um, an awareness that there are many people who are not yet benefiting from a great food system. That now is very much at, at the center of the table. I'm gonna leave it there and I am gonna turn it over to Brooke Harris uh, for a uh, look at what uh, IOBY is doing. And thank you for listening, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing those story. I actually really enjoyed hearing about Planning Day um, in Alaska because you pretty much set me up to talk about what IOB does. We're all about that. Um, so I'm Brooke again. I'm a Detroit Action Strategist with IOB. Um, and IOB stands for In Our Backyards. And we are a national nonprofit organization that helps residents fundraise for community change. And as an action strategist, I am part of a team of individuals who work on the ground in a couple of cities in the US. So we have people in Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Memphis, and soon to be Cincinnati, um, who are from the city and who help people not just crowdfund, but do all the other things that they need to make their project successful. Because while money is important, there are also other things that people may need. So I like to think of myself as a dot connector, um, being able to connect people to different organizations and people doing similar work, help them navigate city processes, um, figure out you know, who owns the vacant lot they want to make into a community garden, and just make sure that they're successful in all ways. So I mentioned that we do crowdfunding. So let me, yep, next slide. What is crowdfunding? Um, crowdfunding is a specific form of fundraising online. So usually you get small to medium-sized donations from a bunch of people. Most of them are people that you know especially with IOB projects, they're people in your neighborhood, they're people from close by, and they're all adding up to a bigger amount for you to do your project. Um, and then you collect those via an online platform such as IOB. Um, it's essentially a new tool for an old strategy of passing the plate or passing the hat, where people come together to get something good done and everyone gives a little bit of what they can. I also wanted to talk a little bit about why crowdfunding as opposed to maybe getting a grant or seeking corporate sponsorship. Um, crowdfunding is really good to get flexible, unrestricted funding. So the only people that you're really accountable to, unlike a grant who might have restrictions and reporting, are your donors. And as long as you stay dedicated to that mission and what they donated to, then it opens up some more possibilities for you. Um, another and my personal favorite is that crowdfunding gets you more than money. You have to go out, you have to talk to people, you have to ask people, you have to pick up the phone, and you get people really engaged in what it is that you're doing. And even if they may not be able to help you financially, a lot of times it's also a good way to get volunteers or to get something else donated. Maybe they don't have money, but maybe they have connections to a venue for you to have your project. Um, it also really helps you get specific about what you need to get done. It's also a great way to show that the people are behind you. If they're willing to give you their money, then they support what you're doing, which can also be a good way to kind of test different ideas. 
to maybe start small if you've got a big vision and then be able to leverage that um, for more funding for more opportunities. So I specifically want to talk about some work we did with the Eastern Market. So this is a picture of one of the sheds. Um, the Eastern Market is a farmer's market here in the city. It is over 100 years old. It is gorgeous. There's lots of old architecture and tons of murals in the district as well. Um, on a normal Saturday, there's hundreds of vendors that come. Thousands of people come from not just the city, but the surrounding suburbs, most of Southeast Michigan. Um, and they can buy fresh produce, meats, um, baked goods. There's a big flower day, usually in May, just so many things. Um, and there's also a lot of brick and mortar businesses around it as well. So different um, food places, different restaurants, the commercial kitchen that I know Sarah might mention um, in her piece after me. But we worked with the Eastern Market Development Corporation um, to kind of dabble in economic, um, I just lost my train of thought, um, but economic mobility. So to be able to kind of help out small business owners and entrepreneurs like Sarah, the next panelist. Um, so anyone who either sold at the market, who used Eastern Market's um, commercial kitchen, or anyone who sold or owned or leased in the, the Eastern Market district, district itself. So those buildings around the actual farmer's market were eligible. Um, they were provided with a grant from the Eastern Market, but it was a match grant. So they had to fundraise the other part. Um, and it was a nice way for IOE to kind of work on economic development, to expand a little bit outside just nonprofits and grassroots orgs, um, and really see how we could help um, small business owners and social entrepreneurs get good done using their businesses as well. So that's my piece, and I am going to pass it um, off to Sarah, who can talk a little bit more about what it was like going through this Eastern Market Growing Communities match. All right, hi everybody. Um, all right, I'll get started. So thank you, Mark, and definitely thank you, Brooke, for the wonderful setup and Brooke for the intro. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my piece, which was the crowdfunding. And as it says here, it was scary for me at first, but very beneficial in the end. All right, so our journey. We received a grant from the Eastern Market Growing Communities Grant, and we were elated because so many different things were going on. We were elevating into a place um, where we were get, getting more stores, we were getting more business, but we needed more equipment <clears throat> and we needed money. We still need some more money, <laughs> but uh, we definitely needed money then. And then we found out it was a matching grant. And then we said, oh. we we're very grateful, but uh, that meant I had all my entrepreneurs out there, you already know, you wear several hats. So I was like, oh fudge, this is just one more hat I have to put on. I have to ask people for stuff. Even though I talk to people all the time about our baked goods and, and everything, but asking for money, oh no, even though I'm taking money when people are buying the projects, it's just, <laughs> it still was terrifying. All right, so this opportunity evicted me out of my comfort zone and it was one of the best things that could have ever happened to be honest we were introduced to the wonderful team at iob in detroit and we also worked with some team members in um, new york the iob team in new york everybody was wonderful everybody was encouraging me um, joe from detroit was just so tremendous at easing my fears and apprehensions we even knew some um, people that we both had in common. And so through that, he was able to help me strategize a plan to um, develop the connections, where to start, how to move forward through there, and just anything that I needed, he was there. And then the team from New York was there as well. So then came our campaign website. I will never forget when Joe 
send me the email like you're going live i'm like oh great <laughs> showtime was about to commence and the eviction from my comfort zone um was about to go so down here on the screen i mean that's how i felt that picture of steve harvey captured my emotions perfectly and then um further down here is the campaign website as you can see we did end up getting fully funded so um, that was a great thing and then your community really does believe in you. So we began with family and close friends, which that's the easy ask in most cases. Um, we even enticed them with the baked goodie. And um, now we moved on to our social media platforms. But we had an outpouring like I never, ever expected. Um, it goes back to what Brooke was saying. When you do this, this um, crowdfunding through IOB, it is a great demonstration of public support. And the engagement piece is not just people's money. While we appreciated people's money, obviously, just the fact that people were telling others, they were sharing it on their social media pages, they were liking it, they were commenting, all of that was support. And support goes far beyond money. It's that encouragement. It's that that vibe that people are giving you, like, "Hey, you can do it. Hey, it's 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 okay. You have a wonderful product. Hey, how about you try this store? What about like so much outpouring of support, like we never expected? Um, I even met a guy in Aldi just <clears throat> grocery shopping, getting some things for the business, and we struck up a conversation. I told him what was going on. Gave me a hundred dollars. No questions asked. I'm like, well, do you want your tax write-off? Man, like, so it just moved me out of my comfort zone, helped me to share my vision, share my dream, talk about it with others. And it was just like, wow, our, our vision is finally coming to light. Uh oh. Okay. So our new reality, courage and strength. We were fully funded. And when I say we, I'm talking about me and my husband and then our uh, team we were able to hire. So we were fully funded and an anonymous person on Facebook paid the rest of the money that was owed on a grant. When I saw her message, tears flooded my face. I kind of get teary eyed thinking about it now because it's just like, I don't even know you. She just happened to hear about it or scroll through through somebody else's page and it's like wow you would do that for me like you don't even know me so um you know good is out there even amidst everything that's taking place now um somebody was willing to fund us that didn't even know us hadn't even tasted our baked good now i could see if she tasted our baked good then this story may be different but um it was just very overwhelming so the results with the extra money we received from the um we had that's not from the grant since the grant was able to pay for equipment and signage and things of that nature we had money to hire part-time staff which was amazing and um i love hiring women because i feel like women should be empowered no offense men nothing against men i have no problem hiring a man either because my husband is a co-order but for women, um, we really just need to empower one another. There's so much negativity out there, so many standards of what beauty is on the internet. Like when I bake, that's my expression of love. That's my therapy. Uh, what I didn't put on my intro, I am a therapist. That is where my background and my degree is in. And so coming into that kitchen is therapy. We sing, we dance, we talk, we just, we bake, we have a great time in that Easter market kitchen. Um, we were also able to, like I said, purchase updated signage, new business cards, equipment. Oh my gosh, we were able to get a food processor. We do a vegan zucchini pineapple bread. My dear sweet husband <laughs> and my sisters would be grating, grating, grating by hand. And now no more, we just do a few pulses. <laughs> Going, I was shredded zucchini, shredded carrots, whatever we need. Um, I gained a new sense of confidence just knowing that 
My community supports what I do. I love being in the city of Detroit. I love helping my people, um, my community members in the city. It's just, I don't know, nothing, it's nothing like Detroit. And I'm sure if you are encouraged and empowered by your city, you feel the same way about your city. And, you know, now I can continue to produce premium and quality baked goods that are flavorfully creative and so delicious to eat. And so I just want to thank IOB Detroit and New York and IOB in general, Island Press, everybody that supported us in every way. Like I said, money is not just, money is helpful, please don't get me wrong, and I still need money, but <laughs> the support, the encouragement, the sharing, word of mouth travels so much farther. So I appreciate that. I thank you all. Thank you. Oh, and all right. So right here is a new sign that we got. That's my husband. That's one of my assistants. Some delicious cake right here. And I did have a baby six months ago. So that's my oldest son and my new son. Um, one of our delicious cakes and me doing one of the things I love in the kitchen. Thank you. Does everyone want to come back on the uh, video and Mark? Do you want to ask any of those questions? I can unmute you. Maybe you were self muted. Okay. You can hear me now, right? Yes. All right. So. Well, thank you both Sarah and Brooke. Um, I would probably crawl to get some really good lavender cupcakes after seeing that picture <laughs> and that cake as well. Um, so, you know, I haven't had lunch yet, so I'm, it's gonna just make me crazy, but thank you both. I think yeah, a couple of things that strike me right away in listening to you talk is, you know, this, this is maybe standard <clears throat> uh, advice for entrepreneurs or would be entrepreneurs, but you start you start out with a risk you take a risk hopefully it's an educated one one that you're perhaps ready to take uh, but nevertheless it's a risk and you're it takes courage i think as sarah is suggesting to uh to do that i think another another piece of good advice is to seek good advice is to find you know business advice if it's a business oriented project you know and that might make sure you check out your community and make you sure you know what's available. Often you'll be surprised that both the public and private sectors have places where uh, small businesses can get advice and help in starting some of their startups. Um, and that they can be good coaches, mentors, or uh, just other supporters that are help you get going. I think the last point that, you know, that Sarah really brings out very strongly was the fact that you got to trust your own community. They're going to be there to support you, hopefully. And uh, and surprisingly, I guess maybe and maybe less so these days. You know, the community is ready to step up and help people who appear to be ready to take that plunge and get a business going. You know, whether it's crowdfunding or something else. So those are just a few quick thoughts. And I'm going to use them to segue into one of the questions that we received from an uh, attendee. Uh, which is, of course, it's about money. Uh, the question is, how are counties and municipalities utilizing a portion of their CDBG allocation, that's Community Development Block Grant allocation, to support revitalization of communities through food? Now, I'm going to expand that question beyond just uh, Community Development Block Grant funding to other funding. I mean, what are communities doing to get funding, say, from the federal government or their state governments or from the private sector to support the development of smaller scale uh, food businesses. Um, 
uh, I guess I'm going to ask our panelists, you know, do you have any thoughts on that particular question? You know, in the course of your work and your research, how have you interacted with other either institutional supporters, government supporters, or foundation supporters to uh, provide the, the kind of capital you need? Anyone who wants to take that, go ahead. Oh, um, well, I can talk a little bit about that of what I know. Um, I've been involved in a lot of things over the past years. I was at one point very heavily involved in my um, neighborhood community just as things changed and I had children, my focus shifted a little bit, but um, I know we would get together and talk about writing grants as a way to improve the community. And now in the food community, I'm a part of Detroit Kitchen Connect uh, through the Easter Market. And that's a really good hub. We're like a really good family. Uh, we'll get emails. And of course, now my nose is running. Thanks. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Great. No, I don't have coronavirus. I just have allergies. And of course, the tissue I had is gone. So, all right, sorry. But we're like a good family here um, at the Easter Market and Detroit Kitchen Connect. And they do provide us with different resources, different um, community classes, different uh, things that the city of Detroit is offering, um, especially now amidst this COVID. Um, there are city of Detroit grants that they're doing for small businesses. So um, those are kind of ways that we utilize as a community, different funding resources. I hope that helped or answer some of the question. I'm going to find some tissue. Excuse me, please. Yeah. Uh, Brooke, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think I'm unmuted. Not too many in addition. Um, just like Eastern Market and other areas do have a lot of programs like Sarah was mentioning where they're able to provide space, um, training, classes, as well as funding to people who are looking to make food a business for themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I've, I'll just add that I have found some of the things that I've found um, have, you know, sort of maybe a, a little more unusual are hospitals. I mean, just and you know, large, large, large healthcare institutions are interested in food uh, for obvious reasons uh, that it promotes good health, and uh, you know their their willingness to put money into some of these projects has been interesting as well as. Uh, community foundations, I think. And, you know, I think one thing that's really interesting about the way that, you know, business financing has evolved is that the, the lines between the for-profit and the non-profit side are blurring, you know, while people certainly have to pay attention to the various tax issues associated with um, the kind of organization or corporation they are. You know, the fact that a non-profit organization can support the development of for-profit organizations you know there's way there are ways to do that uh, money can go can come through a nonprofit organization from a hospital or another or a foundation or other institutions in order to accomplish that there's a tremendous amount of sort of diverse opportunities community colleges have also played a role uh, over the years in uh, community development um, as as of course city hall is um, you know, one thing I one thing I always suggest to people is that you know when you're looking for money and you're looking for sort of that you know in that early startup phase, um, one thing that really is helpful is to create a much bigger background around the idea of, of food development and economic development, so that you know get the city, get your mayor, get your your planning people, your economic development people to recognize food as a part of building a strong local economy. Often it's neglected by public officials. Uh, as I mentioned about Alexandria, Louisiana, you know, you have an example there of a community where uh, the, the, the major economic development institution for the region recognized food as a critical part of their economy and supported it accordingly. So just a few. Now, we have some, uh, we have questions. We're looking for questions from people. Um, Uh, this one is actually directed at Sarah. You are able to locally source your ingredients for your business. Is that were you able to do that, Sarah? 
so so now i am like being a part of the eastern market i have been able to like find um a farmer from michigan who does zucchini she does like these club zucchinis so as soon as they open back up in the summer that's where i'll be getting all of my zucchini from um i'm doing better at you know i found out i could get eggs from local michigan farmers so those are some of the things especially during this downtime that my husband and i have been strategizing to get more local produce um and things that we need because every ingredients that i use that requires fruit i always do my best to use fresh fruit frozen's fine but i prefer fresh because it just gives a difference in the quality of taste and since i you know do the markets and i'm in detroit i want my detroiters to taste that fresh taste i want them to get the best quality possible so i'm doing better at locally sourcing that's good so you certainly it's certainly something that's on your radar so I have one more question, probably have time just for one more and we'll take this one. Do you have any suggestions for best practices for prioritizing racial equity in the food system within developing communities that are racially diverse? Brooke or Sarah, any thoughts on that? How do we prioritize racial equity in the economic development process, particularly when it comes to food? Oh, that's a good question. Oh my gosh, that's a good question. Oh, <laughs> oh man. I have um, the answer. I have so much money. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I can start unless, Sarah, you have something. No, you can start and then I will go from there. Okay. You only have um, one minute. I'm so sorry. I mean, I would. Okay. I'll go like 30 seconds. I think kind of the same way you would go about prioritizing racial equity in any system. Um, aside from like the Eastern market match, I don't do much work in food in my free time. You see, I like animal rescue and, um, you know, gender equity, um, but it's kind of the same. It's who are you talking to? Who is invited to the table, I guess, to use a food thing? I um, mean, who are you prioritizing? Detroit being, um, We'll see with the recent census, but about an 80% black city, um, it's definitely important to kind of pay attention to like the residents who have been there, um, who's been doing the work, who's, you know, who's, um, who has the social capital to get things done. Right. And like Brooke said, it's about having those conversations, being present, showing up to those meetings, bring food. That's the commonality that binds a lot of us together. Once people begin to eat the food, the taste, the flavors, I mean, if you think back to all across our, our nation's history, food is one of those things that have always bound us together and brought us together and brought joy. So it's at make yourself a part of those conversations as, as much as you possibly can. And especially bring lavender cupcakes. <laughs> so, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it back to Jen. Because uh, we are out of time, we really appreciate both Brooke and and Sarah for your contributions, and thank you to the audience for coming. But let's hear from Jen one more time. Yes, thank, thank you. you everyone. Appreciate your time. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, just want to remind you that if you want to pick up Mark's book, you can get it for 30% off. We'll send a link um, after this. We'll also send a recording and the PowerPoint slides so you will have all that content coming to you in an email very soon. And if you have an idea for a project, go to iobi.org slash idea. Don't forget to fill out your survey. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. And thanks again to our wonderful panel.